Mind just giving a small round of applause to her as well? Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the last session of the day, and to me it's actually the most exciting. Um, this is where you guys get to ask all the questions you've ever wanted um, to various clinician scientists at various stages of their career for various clinical and research disciplines. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have the speakers come up and give you a brief presentation just about themselves, uh, what's happened in their lives so far, what they're doing, and then they'll line up in the panel to my left here, and it's rapid fire questions as you please. So to begin, um, I'd like to <coughs> uh, introduce Professor Tree Fan. Um, so Tree is an associate professor of medicine at the University of New South Wales and head of the Intravital Microscopy Laboratory at the Garvin Institute. He graduated from medicine at the University of Sydney and completed a double fellowship in internal medicine and pathology at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Camperdown. His PhD was at the Centenary Institute and his postdoctoral studies are with Professor Jason Sister at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in California, San Francisco. His current lab combines in vivo optical marking, single cell transcriptomics, and CRISPR-Cas9 technologies to track the origin and fate of cells critical to the immune responses in infection, autoimmunity, and cancer. And he was a 2014 ANSTO Eureka Prize winner. Please join me in welcoming Professor Trifan. Great. Thanks very much, Jeff, and thanks, everybody. Um, thanks, Phil the organisers for having me and everybody for being here. I wasn't very sure, I've never done anything like this before, so I thought I'd try and have some fun. And I guess that's really going to be my message for you guys looking forward. I think the key thing with everything that you do is question yourself, are you having fun? And if you're not, think about changing what you do. So, so this really is you know, about having fun. And for me, it's about how I got to live out my sci-fi fantasies. So um, I think Jeff mentioned I started my clinical training um, at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital where I trained in clinical immunology. And really the problem for me was I realised that, that as I started um, practising that we were really bad at treating B-cell diseases. And so that made me want to pursue um, further um, studies and basically try and understand how B-cells work and understand more about B how B-cells make this really critical cell fate decision which it switches from being a very small resting naive B-cell to an actively secreting plasma cell that's making all these antibodies. So I did my PhD at the Centenary where we tried to study um, B cell um, cell fate decision making in a mouse model. And really what we wanted to do then is to be able to visualize, to see these B cell decisions being made in real time. And at the time, some new technologies that were emerging in the United States where they were able to do this thing called two phone microscopy where they could see live cells inside a living animal. Um, and see it make these cell fate decisions. So I went and did my postdoc there. And so what's happened since is I've come back to Sydney. I've set up a lab at the Garvin Institute. Um, and also I have a clinic next door at St Vincent's Hospital. And I think um, this is a really critical um, interaction because what I see in the clinic really feeds what I do in the lab. And then what I do in the lab then I can then take back and help my patients in the clinic. And I'll try and show you a couple of examples of that. So. You know, what makes me different? I guess um, you probably would have heard from a lot of clinician scientists that there are all these advantages. You know, you can seamlessly transition from the bench to the bedside and back. You can fast track the translation of um, your basic science to, to the clinic. Um, and you have this fantastic network with which to access patients and samples. But to me, really, the biggest advantage, I guess, from my background and my training has been that as a clinician, you get to have this big picture and you get to see things in a clinical context. And that's really important because, you know, there's this question that um, when I was training, um, my supervisor, a mentor, used to always ask me at the end of everything I said, which was, so what? Why should we care? And I think being a clinician really helps you frame that. Um, and so how we see things is, is that um, we try to see things in a global context, you know, the, the body is a complex multicellular organism and all these cell fate decisions are being made in response to environmental stimuli. So for us, that means we need to see things within space and time, but also within the um, whole organism. And that really is going to then help us understand how these decisions give rise to problems with immunity, autoimmunity and cancer. So um, in our lab, what we do is the first thing for us that's really important is that we need to see what's going on. So for, and that means we use two-photo microscopy to see biology in action in a real live animal. 
Once we see it, then we need to really be able to develop a language with which to describe this behavior. So we see these cells moving around, we see them interacting. We need to develop quantitative tools with which to define those movements. But then the next step is then to understand that. What are the, what are the molecular processes that are driving that behavior? And for us, the go-to technique has been to use um, single cell RNA sequencing uh, to understand the heterogeneity within that these cells and, and how that gives rise to the differences that we're seeing. And once we think we understand it, then we need to test our understanding. So we then go on to develop uh, mouse models in which we've modified the um, expression of genes, um, mostly within mice. Um, so we test and retest. And for us, the most important step is this final step here, where we get to apply our understanding to diagnose and treat human diseases. And I'll, I'll um, touch on something that I'm very excited about, which is this Clinical Immunogenomics uh, Research Consortium Australasia, or CIRCA, that I've been involved with. So how does all this make me um, uh, a better scientist? Well, I'll just touch on one example of this. And, and so we've known for a long time this concept of immunity since, you know, the description of the plague of Athens, Athens in 430, that people once infected with something will either not get it again or if they get it again, it won't be as severe. And it, this immunity actually um, underpins the success of vaccines and all vaccines so far, the, the successful ones have worked through the generation of humoral immunity, in other words, through the generation of memory B cells and long-lived plasma cells. But we don't. what we don't understand is how the memory B cells protect us, how do they become the plasma cells that make antibodies that protect us upon re-exposure. And then if we understand that, then we can make better vaccines. Um, uh, and this is particularly important um, with the threat of all these emerging um, diseases. And then if you just think about it, the flu vaccine, you have to have a flu vaccine every year. What if we can make a universal flu vaccine? So they just have to have one shot um, and that would cover you um, from one year to the next. So, you know, for us, to be able to see these things, that means that we need to make fluorescent reporters. So what I'm showing you here is a movie that my PhD generated where we looked at the decisions that are made by a memory B cell in a live animal. And these memory B cells are, are green, I'm sorry, are red. And when they become plasma cells, they turn on a gene that makes them green as well. So the orange cells, so the, so the green and red cells, are the plasma cells. And so these studies, what they showed was that in, in an animal, in the draining lymph node, the immunity is actually provided by these plasma cells that are differentiating in this new structure we discovered called the subcapsular proliferative foci. Now, the reason why this is important was that this was only seen in a mouse, in an animal. And so the question is, so what? And so through our um, connections with the hospital, we're actually able to then go and get a lymph node from patients um, and then see that, in fact, these stru this structure is all also there um, in patients. And this structure's always been there and it's ne never been seen before. And I think the reason why we've stumbled upon it is because of what I was saying before, that you know we have a very unique approach um, that allows us to do these things. And that approach really comes from the fact that we have a background in both science uh, and the clinic. And so what about the other way around? So um, I'm just gonna tell you about this patient that I was referred um, from a number of other um, specialists. 51-year-old man, HIV negative, with classical Kaposi, Kaposi sarcoma. So this is a cancer that's seen in HIV patients because of waning immunity. And so there's a suggestion that if you have Kaposi sarcoma, you may have an underlying immunodeficiency. And so through our connections and through our um, basic science um, uh, collaborations, we were able to, to work out that the blood of this patient was very unusual and atypical for and Based on that, we were able to then go on and sequence the genome and found that he had a variant in a, in a gene called CTLA-4. Now, this variant had never been described before, so we weren't entirely clear whether this variant was causing his disease. And what was complicating it was that patients with mutations in CTLA-4 have a classic syndrome called CHI, and he doesn't have a lot of the features of the CHI syndrome. So what we were then able to do was do functional studies, but also RNA sequencing, which then established truly that this was a pathogenic variant. Um, the significance of this for him was that, you know, for all his adult life, he'd been ostracized um, and labeled as a malingerer. And so we were able to end his diagnostic odyssey, give him an actual biological basis for his disease. But more importantly, his cancer had relapsed despite salvage chemotherapy. And because we had a genetic diagnosis, we were able to 
start him on a mechanism specific gene specific treatment uh, which was to um, uh, this drug um, called Everolimus um, and he's responding now really well to the treatment um, so uh, that was through collaborations um, with this um, Circa network so I guess my main message to you is that um, we'll have a lot of fun really and, and, and I think you'll be able to help a lot of people um, if you pursue a career in both that's all I have to say So I think we'll leave questions until the panel session, which will just be shortly, and we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Vita Berznis, um, who is a senior lecturer in endocrinology and metabolism at Western Sydney University and the University of South Wales, and she leads the metabolic research unit at Blackdown Clinical School and Research Centre. Over the last 10 years, her research has focused on determining how fat and protein, metabolism, body composition, and physical function is regulated by hormones, with the goal being to establish a link between fundamental research and clinical application. For example, developing a novel safe treatment for sarcopenia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vita Besnis. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. So I have a title, Surviving as a Clinical Researcher, and sometimes we really feel that we have to survive as a researchers. So I come from Latvia, which is a small but beautiful country in northern part of Europe. And this is country with proper snowy winters. So I did my medical training. I completed medical training in Latvia. And if it was not cold enough in Latvia, I decided to do my PhD in Sweden, in northern part of Sweden. So this is Umeå University, where I did my PhD. And this was a usual sight in the morning, trying to find your bike and, and then cycle through the snowstorm to the university. But then we, of course, enjoyed a lot of beauty as well in that northern part of Europe. So the biggest achievement of my PhD is definitely the birth of my two daughters. From the research point of view, um, during my PhD, I investigated the effects of neuroactive steroids and serotonin and GABA systems from the mood and memory point of view. And part of my PhD formed grounds for establishment of a drug development company called Umicrine. So my uh, supervisor, Turbin Beckstrom, was a founder of that company. So we did great things. But most of my PhD was spent either in a dark room counting receptors or doing uh, behavioral studies in rats. Uh, for example, we are testing how neuroactive steroids affected special learning and memory in the Morris water maze. I enjoyed that, and to extent that I had to put a rat in a bathtub on, on the cover of my thesis. But after completing my PhD, I kind of missed patients, and I decided to uh, start clinical research. So, after Sweden, we moved to Sydney, and I started to work at the Garvan Institute of Medical Research with Professor Ken Ho um, at the Pituitary Research Unit. So why this lab? Because Ken is one of the best in neuroendocrinology internationally, and Garvan has a clinical research facility. So I started clinical research. I absolutely adore that and never look back. And this is what I have been doing since. So I was happy in clinical research until my boss decided to move to Brisbane. So after that, I still stayed at Garvan for a few years. And then Professor Mark McLean invited me to join Western Sydney University, which I did, so I established Metabolic Research Unit. Around that time, I got a major NHMRC grant, so I um, was able to hire research assistant and clinical research nurses, so I established my own research group. So this is my clinical research facility, and this is one of the patients from our uh, prostate cancer and exercise study. So the research that I do is around how hormones regulate metabolism. And recently we um, have been developing program for lifestyle and surgical intervention for treatment of obesity and diabetes. I have interest in establishing neuroendocrine effects of estrogens. 
For example, how estrogen receptor modulators by reducing growth hormone secretion and hepatic action induce hepatic steatosis. I also use um, androgen deprivation therapy in prostate cancer as a model of hypogonadism to, uh, to, to look at androgen effects and whether resistance training can prevent adverse effects induced by androgen deprivation on metabolism. I also use lipidomics as a tool to investigate whether changes in maternal lipid species can determine development of gestational diabetes in moms or macrosomian babies. I have interest in investigating mechanisms for the antineoplastic effect of diabetes drug metformin uh, in prostate cancer. I have interest in gender difference. What determines gender difference in body composition? For example, whether gender difference, how growth hormone regulate myocans such as decrin, uh, can be used to explain why we have different muscle mass. Um, I have also interest in hepatic androgen action. Uh, for example, to investigate whether uh, liver-targeted testosterone therapy can be used as a novel safe treatment for sarcopenia in elderly. So I have a large variety of projects. So these are my current affiliations. I'm senior lecturer at Western Sydney University, conjoint senior lecturer at UNSW. I'm ordinary medical officer at Blacktown Hospital. I'm member of Translational Health Research Institute and I'm still honorary clinical researcher at Garvan Institute. But in fact, in a one month's time, I'm moving to UNSW with a goal to start or establish metabolic clinical research at that university. I adore clinical research, so I really hope that you will enjoy it too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernice. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Vincent Ho, who is a consultant gastroenterologist at Campbelltown Hospital and leads a the Translational Gastroenterology Research Program at the Western Sydney University School of Medicine, focusing on basic science and clinical research in the gut. His clinical research focuses on looking at the use of new medications to improve gut motility and innovative treatments, including electrical stimulation for rare disorders such as gastroparesis. And his basic science research involves the isolation and development of interstitial cells of Kajal and intestinal organoids. Please welcome Dr. Vincent Ho. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Thank you for the organizing committee uh, and to the Academy for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a it's a real honor to speak to all of you and to show you my journey. Um, this talk isn't so much about what I'm currently doing re with research, but about the journey. Um, so just bear with me uh, on this one. Um, what I want to say, I guess, first off, is that I'm a great believer in serendipity, but I also believe in the um, ability to take advantage of opportunities that come your way. Uh, in my case, certainly it was a combination of serendipity as well as some opportunities that came up my way that's led to my current career path. So I've always been interested in medical science. Um, in particular, I've always enjoyed um, reading about popular science and particularly the things that come out of the lab, but I didn't really get involved with lab science until the end of medical school. So year six, uh, I was a medical student at, at the University of New South Wales. Um, during the summer break, I was given a, a research scholarship and I did some work on uh, pediatric leukemic cells, testing different cytotoxic drugs at the Children's Cancer Institute. So I really enjoyed that work and I wanted to do more of it, but then internship started. So you can imagine when internship starts, everything put, is put on hold, the clinical work takes over, and I found myself looking after patients, I found myself studying for exams, passing through, through, through exams, it's a whole process. And so you put your interest in, um, in research uh, kind of to the side. Um, during that time, when I was training, I also had the opportunity to travel, and I spent um, quite a lot of time in Queensland. I did my gastroenterology training, my advanced training in Queensland. My first year was in Cairns, uh, and it was in Cairns that I had some very supportive consultants who were very encouraging of me doing research. Um, they thought that I had a potential career path in a research um, based upon some of the interests that I 
um, had at the time. Um, this is a patient of mine, Leah Kelly, who I got to know um, during my time in, in Cairns, and she's a lady who had chronic diarrhea ever since she was an infant. Um, uh, we managed her, um, did a lot of investigations, found out ultimately what the problem was, put her on treatment, and then she got better. We reported this at an international conference, um, and it was well received. I guess that provided a lot of validation to sort of continue this work, get some more case reports, and also publish um, some more research. That year, we also published um, some work on um, esophageal cancer characteristics in Indigenous patients. That was the first study of, of its kind. And that got me really interested in esophageal cancer. So during my um, last year of gastroenterology training, I did a, a fellowship, a medical education fellowship at Townsville Hospital, and I had close affiliations with James Cook University, JCU. Um, I was doing that year, I got really involved in medical education. I enjoyed setting up a research series for, ju for junior doctors and helped to organize a symposium, um, which is a combined JCU Townsville Hospital symposium that I think still continues to this very day. Um, but it was also that year that I met my girlfriend, who um, my now wife, um, she was uh, in Sydney and we dated long distance. And I didn't quite know what I was going to do after finishing training, but I knew that I had to come back to Sydney the following year to make the relationship work. Um, but just as it happened, this is where serendipity comes into it. Um, during that year, I was also on the organizing committee for a conference, which was the Australian New Zealand Association of Health Professional Educators, very long name, we call it ANZAPI. Um, and they organize a lot of the health educational events, but I was helping to organize a conference. And one of the dinner events, I met up with the president at the time, who was the professor of medical education at Western Sydney University, Ian Wilson. I had a good chat to him, and he encouraged me to contact some academics at the School of Medicine. So I did that, and after some time, I managed to speak to Professor Anne-Marie Hennessy, who is the foundation professor of medicine, now current dean. And she advised me that there was a position coming up as a lecturer in medicine, which was a, going to be a clinical academic position, a position that spanned um, work at Campbelltown Hospital as a clinician, but also doing some work at the university, um, obviously carrying out research and teaching. So I applied, it was a competitive process, but somehow I got the position. Um, now the clinical part of it um, was busier than I imagined, and I'm going to leave that for another time, um, but... Uh, one of the things that I got earlier on, and I was very lucky to get this, was some lab space. You can see our laboratory here. This is our translational gastroenterology laboratory, and we have our student, PhD student, Prapti Stressa. So she's our very first PhD student. Very lucky to get this. Um, but when you've got a new lab, you think to yourself, well, I've got to make use of this. You know, what's the point of having a new lab if you're not doing anything with it? And so I thought to myself, well, I've also got to have some basic science research skills, more than what I just acquired um, at the end of medical school. So I embarked upon a PhD um, with Professor Sun Lee. So he's a head of pathology at the school. And this was a very long PhD. Um, it took me seven and a half years, graduated late last year. So it took a long time. Um, and you think to yourself, well, as an academic you, maybe there's time to sort of carry out a PhD, but as a busy clinician, it's very hard to get the right balance. So I don't think I could have done it any earlier than that. Then again, serendipity comes in um, because during that time, we were contacted by a community organization, the Akagi Group, Esophageal Cancer Awareness Group. Um, this is um, Polly Grundy over here, and she um, is the head of the Akagi Group. She lost her husband to esophageal cancer, I happened to have an interest in esophageal cancer back from my days in Cairns, and it was a natural fit. Um, we carried out some work uh, with her support on the esophage esophageal microbiome, uh, looking at um, Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer, um, and she's remained a, a very valuable um, support. You know, she's been instrumental in providing us um, support financially and also through community awareness um, to this present day. Also, during yeah. my... Um, second year of starting as a consultant, I came across this lovely lady um, over here, that's Ashi Alum, 
she has a condition called gastroparesis. Uh, and this is a condition, chronic condition, where um, the stomach isn't emptying very well. They can get ongoing daily nausea and, and vomiting. Now, I'm someone who likes to, to delve into things extensively. So did a battery of tests, did all the standard treatments under the stun. But despite all this, I couldn't get her better. I couldn't improve the gastric emptying. I couldn't improve her symptoms. So um, I said to her, look, you know, I can't promise you a cure. Well, what I can do is I can actively research this condition because the condition in Australia wasn't very well researched to that point. Um, and then as a consequence, we've developed an entire research program around gastroparesis. We've got a community network of gastroparesis sufferers and their families, and they've been invaluable um, they've been um, lobbying um, governments in terms of, of awareness and political funding. So that's all been really invaluable. So a whole research program has come out of that. And I guess finally, um, talking about what I'm doing now um, as a clinical academic, so I'm looking currently in promoting good messages about the gut, scientific messages. And the reason for that is because we hear a lot of myths about the gut and about all these dietary fads. Um, there's a lot of muddled messages, I think, about the gut microbiome. So currently I'm trying to inform the public with accurate information, easy to understand information, and trying to hopefully link it with a fascination with the laboratory, what happens here. So I want to finish off by saying this is an um, article that was published by the ABC. They actually commissioned us to do some work um, in our lab looking at the effects of alcohol uh, on different types of bacteria that grew out of a shoe. So it's called the, the, the we call it the shoey project. Um, so we just different types of alcohol in the shoe. And we found that um, live bacteria grew only out of one shoe that was immersed in champagne. So I guess the take home message is, if you're celebrating with a shoey, just don't celebrate that with champagne. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, so my pleasure to now introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Martha Chihade, who is a Royal Australasian College of Surgeons General Surgical Registrar within the Western Sydney Surgical Network, who has interrupted her clinical training after four years to pursue a PhD. And she's now in her second year um, at the Cancer Genetics Laboratory of the Colling Institute. She chose to do this as she feels that surgery and science will become ever more intertwined throughout her career and has found balancing theatre time, laboratory and motherhood to be challenging but rewarding. Please welcome Dr. Martha Chihane. Uh, thanks, everyone. First of all, I want to say thank you, of course, to the Academy for inviting me to be a part of the panel. And also, I want to say that I feel very humbled to be asked to be a part of this panel because I'm overwhelmed by the wealth of knowledge and experience that I've heard about from the speakers so far. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I have one slide because my journey is so far at the beginning, basically. I'm at the inception. But I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, to start off with, I, uh, had, I did Bachelor of Medical Sciences at Sydney University. Then I went on and um, did the MBBS program through Sydney Uni as well, did my internship, residency, always knew I wanted to become a surgeon. In fact, in the holiday period between um, the end of medical school and the beginning of internship, rather than you know, having a little bit of time to enjoy myself, I immersed myself in a project um, doing prosection basically and contributing a anatomical prosection to the Sydney University Anatomy Lab. So it, as I um, had gone through internship and residency, I was asking questions about, all right, here we are, clinical practice guidelines, this is the best evidence, this is obviously what we want to do for our patients, but where did all this come from? And how good is the research? How robust are these findings? And then when I uh, got onto the surgical training program, studied for the part ones, these were the sort of questions that were also cropping up as I was coming through um, doing my study. As part of surgical training, we have a requirement to do a research project. And uh, one thing that I found quite frustrating was that you couldn't really do a serious scientific research project while you were being seconded off to a different place every six months to be on a one in four on-call roster, realistically. So um, I got through that, but at the end of four years, I decided that I really did want to 
spend some serious time doing research. And I got in touch with a surgeon, a, a clinician scientist who I knew from my work at Coffs Harbour Hospital, and uh, you may know him, some of you, he's Professor Stanley Sidhu, he's a surgeon scientist here. And I asked if he had a PhD project that, uh, that, um, that he could give me in his lab, and he did. He had one on adrenocortical cancer, which is an orphan disease, um, very poor prognosis. But what's interesting is that some patients with this disease do really well, and some, most patients actually do very poorly. And um, what I was given was a task to have a look at the gene signatures of long non-coding RNAs that are expressed in uh, clinician, uh, clinical samples of uh, different patients with these cancers. And now I'm looking at the function of one of these long non-coding RNAs. And through my journey, I've been given the opportunity to uh, do CRISPR-Cas9 experiments, gene editing, and I've, um, you know, although they're very exciting, you also get that real challenge of working with uh, problems like off-target effects and them just not working very well. But that's the ups and downs of PhD life. Um, this is just a snapshot of my life so far. Uh, up here, this was the last theatre list I did in my pregnancy, eight months pregnant, so I still assist in theatre. Uh, this is me working in the lab in the dead of night because that's when you can. Uh, this is my desk. It looks awful. Um, this is my baby who I had eight months ago uh, in this journey and um, just like you said, Vida, um, that's probably been so far the biggest achievement of my PhD. And I'm finding uh, that is also the most challenging part of keeping the balance. This is her waking up in the morning when I wasn't there. This is her going to sleep at night when I wasn't there. This is her being taken on a walk when I wasn't there. This is when I've had to bring her into the uh, lab so that I could get work done with her there. <laughs> so. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you know all of the trials and tribulations and um, the investment that I've asked other people to make in my journey, because it's not just about me, it's everyone else around me who's also making sacrifices to see me through. I'm hoping that this will all be worth it in the end, and I think it will be, because so far I've already seen the benefits of, um, of going embarking on this uh, research journey. So um, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chihade. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tom Guy, who's currently an intern at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, uh, having previously completed his PhD at the Centenary Institute University of Sydney, followed by a medical degree at the University of Wollongong. And in addition to his work as a junior doctor at RPA, he's currently running a collaborative clinical research project between the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute and the Charles Perkins Centre, which is at the University of Sydney, uh, which aims to characterise the immune landscape in head and neck cancers, combining histological, cellular and molecular techniques to predict patient outcomes. Please welcome Dr. Tom Guy. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, the opportunity to speak today. And it's also just been uh, wonderful to hear so many inspiring stories from other clinician scientists and uh, their journeys. So I'm Tom. I'm currently an intern at RPA Hospital, um, which mainly means that I chart fluids and write on WOWs around the ward. Um, but when I'm not doing that, I'm also a research fellow at the Charles Perkins Centre. Um, I guess my background uh, is a bit different from other people here in that um, I actually started off wanting to be um, predominantly a scientist and did an honours uh, year in PhD with Professor Barbara Fazakis at the Centenary Institute, uh, which is all about cancer immunotherapy. Um, as I got towards the end of that, of my PhD, I really wanted to understand more about the clinical context of the work that I was doing. So I uh, decided to uh, think, thought about doing medicine. I ended up meeting a professor from Wollongong University named Ronald Sluther at a conference and he really suggested that I should come to Wollongong to do my medical degree. Um, he was very supportive at that time and he really facilitated me being a clinician scientist and I was able to help lecture in immunology and teach other honours and PhD students while I was there and supported me to um, seek funding when I didn't think that I would actually be able to get it and so some of the funding that I was able to get from the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute helped me to do some of the research that I'm currently ongoing, uh, that I'm doing now, um, and also helped fund uh, me going over to Boston for the last three months of my medical degree. So I spent the last three months over at Harvard Medical School and got to do clinics at Mass Gen Hospital, which was an incredibly fun and uh, exciting experience. 
pretty much, but that area of Boston is pretty much like Disneyland for anyone that wants to be a clinician researcher. Um, and I'm now a JMO. So just to give you a bit of an idea about uh, my PhD work, which is really what um, set me to, to do the work I'm trying to do now, um, is that I got very interested in how the adaptive immune system is involved in cancer predominantly. And this is a mouse model that I made, um, or some data from, uh, from the mouse model that I made. And essentially what we're able to do is we look at the adaptive immune system in mice that had melanoma, um, and by bleeding these mice on day 40 and then also looking at the immune cells within their um, blood at this time, what we essentially able to do was to find a biological sort of number whereby if you had more than 6% of your T cells were specific for your tumour at day 40, then that would guarantee that you would clear your tumour and that if you didn't have that, if you were just below that line, then you would succumb to your tumour. Um, what was interesting about this is when we look at the blood on day 40 and then compare that to the blood on the day of death for each mouse, and then we compare that to then what we see in the lymph node, the spleen, and the tumour, this all correlated very nicely. And this was true for the T cells in these experiments, the B cells in these experiments, and also some of the regulatory immune uh, components as well. So what's really felt, really sort of, I guess, established to me was a real interest in analysing the adaptive immune system in the blood of both mice and our patients and trying to understand chronic uh, diseases that involve the immune system. Um, coming from a very basic research side of things and now coming into the clinical world, one of the things I really find quite interesting is that from the immune system point of view, it pretty much is involved in most medical specialties. But when it comes to how clinical research is done today, it's all very much based on clinical departments. So we take one cohort of patients from one with one disease, do one technique on them. Usually that material is consumed by that uh, series of testing and then it's compared to healthy um, individuals. Whether or not some of these things that we're finding in the adaptive immune system are true for a number of diseases or wh whether or not we actually find some uh, bona fide, complete, unique, uh, mechanistic uh, components for them is really unclear. So I think the future work that I'd like to do over the next 30 or 40 years is really trying to compare a number of chronic inflammatory diseases that involve the adaptive immune system, so comparing uh, different types of cancer or immune diseases and chronic infections to try and find some new mechanisms, work out which ones are unique to specific diseases and then find new treatments for them. So, as I mentioned, I was very lucky with Ron Sluter's support that I got a grant, a clinical research grant, at the University of Wollongong. And so this allowed us to start collecting blood samples and tumour tissue from patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma um, at Wollongong Hospital. Um, at the moment, we've been analysing those blood samples using the mass cytometer at the Charles Perkins Centre. Um, we're also planning on looking at some solid tissue with the imaging platform of that as well. So essentially just flow cytometry, but essentially looking at 40 or 50 markers at once. Um, we're also looking at the serum and also um, I'm going to go back to Boston at some point with these samples and then do some genetic um, genomic analysis and also methylation studies with Shiv Pillai, who I spent the three months with over there. Um, the cancer um, concept biobank is currently uh, increasing the numbers of cancers that we're actually freezing at the moment. So that means we'll be able to study a wide variety of cancers. And since my time at RP Hospital has started, we've also discussed with other um, departments. We're also planning on doing a similar analysis in patients with HIV who get recurrent infections and also patients uh, who have a renal transplant. So the only thing I can say is that um, through all this uh, I guess early journey, um, the, the main thing I've had is some very good mentors, whether it was Barbara, my original PhD supervisor, or Ron in Wollongong, um, and a large other group of people that are really helping me do the research I'm doing at the moment. Um, I think that the only advice I can give is that I think at the start of things, it's okay if you're not sure if you what sort of what your big research question is that you want to do, but it's just a good thing to give it a go. When I was at the Centenary Institute, I was lucky enough to meet Matthew Vardis, who was the director there, who was also very interested in sailing. Um, through his help, I was actually able to do four Sydney to Hobart yacht races with him while I did my PhD. Um, I can say there's a lot of similarities between ocean racing and research in that when you're halfway between on Bass Strait and then wind, wind's getting worse, there's bigger waves, you think, oh, this is a terrible, terrible idea. I never should have done this. Much like my PhD for a while. Um, but you get out the other side and you think that it was an incredible thing to do and had some incredible experiences. So and I just think anyone who is interested in doing research should just give it a go. There's some wonderful supervisors here today that you've heard from that um, are experts in their field. So if there's something that really draw your attention today to just give it a go and just um, that's all you can really do. Thank you, Dr Guy. Um, so I'd now like to invite um, all of our panel speakers to come up to the seats at the front um, and Kurt will kindly be 
having the roaming microphone for you guys to ask questions. And <coughs> I've got one microphone for you guys as well. Um, so I might kick off proceedings. Um, so I think today uh, we've heard from a variety of different speakers that the environment in which you decide to do a research project is very important. Um, And with the environment of your research project being quite important, um, the question that I had was, have you guys found yourself in a situation whereby you've been in a not quite so suitable environment for your research? And how have you gone about extricating yourself from that environment? Tough question, but I think it's good to start there. Well, now I'm moving to University of New South Wales. So <laughs> I'm changing my environment. Not that it was bad before, but I felt that I have exhausted myself from the point of view where I can grow. So I felt that I established everything what I could establish at Western Sydney University. And for me to grow, I had to find other path for my research. And was that, an, was that an active pursuit of yours? Or was that, that kind of something that kind of came to you? How did that, come, how did that happen? Well, um, at Western Sydney University, my position was predominantly a research position, but that was re the reason why university would not have extensive amount of salary support. So initially I had five years salary support and then I had one and a half years. So then you're trying to think if you would like to succeed in research, you, you kind of need stability, at least from your salary point of view, because I could sustain my research, I could get smaller or larger research funding. But then if your salary is under the questions, then you kind of think, what next? Sure. OK. Did any other uh, panel speakers have any comments about that question regarding the environment of your research? Yep. So um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, if you are a clinical academic and you've got a busy clinical load, then it can be quite challenging to get research done. Um, I mean, I, I have a, quite a busy clinical load. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist, um, but I do one in four on call. And if you, if you know gastroenterology, it's quite intense. You've got some really sick patients in. Um, one on four on call is, is, is tough. Um, but then you've also got to combine that with doing clinics as well as uh, endoscopy lists. And you can quickly see that you don't have that much time to do research. Again, um, Trying to factor in research around that is important. I, I think that generally, as a as a clinical academic, if there, if I've come, if a patient comes in with a with an emergency, I'll just drop the research to, to address that problem. Like if it's a variceal bleed, I'm on call. I've got to do it. Like there's just no no other way. So that has in many ways hampered my um, PhD. It's why I took in, in many ways why I took so long, seven and a half years. Um, but at the same time, reflecting upon it, even though it's very intense, um, it's still quite rewarding because you can see at the end of the day how your research could directly influence um, patient management and vice versa. I want to ask um, a follow-up question then. Um, so for the members of the panel who have quite a bit of procedural aspects in their clinical work, um, aside from clinics, which as an outpatient or clinics and then inpatient care, another aspect of your work for those who are proceduralists in actually doing the procedure, getting your case hours up, getting familiar, getting that muscle memory. So for both Dr. Chihade as well as Dr. Ho, that managing that extra component, um, how have you found that? Okay. So, look, I'm fortunate in that... Um, I gained a lot of endoscopy experience um, during my training. So when I started uh, as a consultant, so I started as a clinical academic, um, I'm, I'm already qualified um, with a lot of procedures behind my belt. Having said that, obviously, um, you're, you're still evolving as a junior consultant. You're coming in with difficult cases. And so there's always that evolution um, of your 
well, it's not just cognitive memory, but procedural memory, procedural experience. The, I think the most difficult part of being a clinical academic and, and a proceduralist is the, is the on-call, um, the fact that you could have, in my case, a bleeder or a food bolus and you would have to drop everything. I mean, it could happen during the daytime. You could be on after hours. At my hospital, we've got one advanced trainee, which means that they can cover during the daytime from about, say, 8 to 5. But after hours, we can't expect the trainee to be on call all the time. So therefore, we get direct calls from emergency. That's tough. That that's happens after hours, also on the weekend. So it's common in a week that I'm on to, to go to hospital a couple of times, maybe two or three times to, um, to do emergency cases. Thank you. Uh, for me, I think this was a very important consideration because I completed four years of surgical training and then decided to interrupt at that point to pursue a PhD. And if you have a look at uh, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, they have quite strict um, guidelines about how much time you can take off to pursue research. And it's really three years, maximum of four. And that means that while you're having to do a full-time PhD, you're also having to come back to a full-time clinical load and then pass your fellowship exams. So there's a long period of time relatively in your training where you're not necessarily um, ass assessing acutely unwell patients. You're not necessarily doing the high-risk trauma laparotomies and the sort of operations that you don't want to lose muscle memory in. Um, it's a very good question. So for me, it became a question of timing. When is it optimal to interrupt? Is it in the middle of training or is it after your fellowship? And I decided that for me, I was going to interrupt during training because I had the opportunity to then work up my skills again when I was reintroduced to the training program. But in this time, I still assist, as you see, and that means that that's time that's competing with the time I can spend in the lab. So on the days that I have full day operating lists, I come in in the evening to the lab to make up for um, the, the time I need to spend experimenting. And it all just comes down to a question of balance and whether you think that that sacrifice is going to be worth it. For the two um, clinicians on the panel whose clinical disciplines uh, traditionally have more relations with the laboratory, meaning endocrinology as well as immunology, do you find that maintaining a clinical aspect to your work gives you an edge that pure scientists do not have? And do you find that to be a benefit or do you find it to perhaps be more of a burden? We might ask Prof, Prof uh, Fan for some input first. Um, it's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> so, so look, I, I, I think I might just backtrack a little bit. And I remember when I started out um, wanting to do a PhD, I was told by... Um, Professor Tony Baston, that now he thought that wasn't possible to be a really, really good doctor and a really, really good scientist at the same time. So that was about 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and I have to say, I think that's changed a lot since then, because back then, I think, you, you know, to be a really, really good cutting edge scientist, you really have to be on top of the game and you have to be fully immersed in what you were doing. And, and as you say, I think it is a little bit easier for some specialties like um, immunology, hematology, endocrinology, because I think now the practice of medicine is changing. Um, you know, we're sort of now in a post-genomic era. I know genomics has promised a lot, but particularly for the practice that I do, which is looking after patients with adult immunodeficiency diseases, um, we're finding the genes all the time now. And the problem is that as we sequence the genome and we find the genes, um, we're finding variants that haven't been described before, which means that we have to prove that those variants are actually pathogenic. So being a scientist allows you to bridge that gap very quickly. And, and in fact, we now have multidisciplinary teams that meet once a month. Well, we not, don't just have doctors in the room, but scientists in the room as well. So, you know, I'd go back to what I was told 20 or 30 years ago and say that while 20, 30 years ago it may have been very difficult to be a scientist, and a doctor at the same time. I think now it's probably critical that we're scientists and doctors at the same time. And then moving forward, I kind of, you know, I sort of was humbled a few um, weeks or months ago. There was a report where 
these people had gone through 1.3 billion med electronic me health records in China and taught a machine to make a diagnosis just as well, actually better than the pediatricians. So, you know, you need to reflect on where the future of medicine is going to be and how the practice of medicine will play out in the years to come. Um, and I think being, you know, really, not, not, I mean, not hardcore, but being really comfortable with the language of science and being able to pass, you know, there's a lot of rubbish being published, for example, but, you know, I think that's probably one of the best things to get from doing a PhD is that ability to think critically and ability to recognise rubbish um, and fads. Um, and, and so, you know, and then back, well, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I need to get it out. Well, one more thing, I guess, is for a lot of you guys starting out thinking about doing a PhD, I think you need to ask yourself why you're doing it. Um, I think I, I, I see a lot of people who've plunged into a PhDs for what I think are not the best reasons. They do it because their boss thinks that, you know, they think their boss wants them to do it and they'll get them a job in a hospital. You know, I, I think what you really need to do is find out what you're really passionate about, what you really want to do. Uh, find a question that really, really excites and interests you. And if you're really, really good at it, then whatever happens, they're going to become knocking on your door. It's not going to be you, you know, lined up and you know, you're the 10th in line for them. You've got to wait for 10 consultants to die at the hospital before you get a job, right? <laughs> you know, you're going, to be the, you're, you're going to be the person that 10 hospitals in Australia or around the world are going to be knocking on the door saying, please come and work with us. You know, I, I think it should be the other the other way around and you should really really find some a really really good reason to do a PhD and then you won't find yourself in situations where you're doing something with a supervisor you don't like a project that you don't really like um, so really do your research Sorry. <laughs> I'm in fact not doing clinic clinics anymore um, so I'm only in clinical research and Probably that's why I love that so much because I still I'm still is exposed to to patients and sometimes I do clinical studies where I look at healthy controls and then I do studies with like growth hormone deficiency or acromegaly patients and whenever I see patients I just light up and this is something that really excites me because I can feel still that part of me that I am a doctor that that I can use that, all that knowledge for, for my clinical research and then nowadays I more work with clinics with other departments to change maybe policies to introduce something um, like policy change um, that I probably would not be able to do if I'm just mm. yeah, working as a, as a clinician. And then now, now for our two uh, slightly more junior members of the panel clinically. Um, Professor Fictory earlier today mentioned that there's often regulations that you come across that can hinder or sometimes advance your progress of your clinician science career. In particular, she was referring to the fact that currently our understanding is that when you finish your medical schooling, you need to start your internship within three years of that time. Otherwise, you, you might possibly need to go back and do your final year of medical school again, God forbid. Um, so I guess the question that I have for Dr. Guy and Dr. Chihade is, have you found dealing with any of these bureaucracies or these regulations, whether it be APRO, RANS, uh, RACS and the RACP, have you found them to be helpful or a bit difficult to understand? I think one of the major issues that um, I'm seeing for some people doing PhDs and going into clinical medicine uh, is that a lot of the, there's a hole for grants about where you can actually, um, about being able to get money because um, essentially once you've done your PhD, you're only a sort of early career researcher for so long and that really is, um, if you do medical school or if then you do your, your clinical training, um, that really sort of depletes that entire period of time. So. Um, there's, I guess there's an issue for funding, which I am finding slightly difficult for at the moment. Um, it's always good to have friends with lots of funding when you try and do your research. So, um, And then obviously once you get sort of more of a track record, then that means that you can build up your own funding independently. But I'd say that's probably one of the biggest issues for me at the moment. Uh, I think uh, for us, Rex does offer some funding opportunities. So that's really good because they do support research but at the same time I think uh, there's a lack of understanding of what basic science research actually takes uh, especially in surgical training 
because of the time frame that they limit you to. Sometimes it's not really possible to do all of your research to the depth that you want to in that time frame. So it means it limits your choice of project, which might mean that you can't really pursue what you really love. <laughs> but also, um, you know, it, it's it's a double-edged sword, I think. You've got to take the good with the bad. And for, for me, for someone who wants to become a surgeon scientist in the end, I think on one hand, I do appreciate the opportunity to do science and the um, emerging, increasing support that we're getting through um, surgical training programs for science. But I think it, it's also a work in progress and it's something that, you know, will become better and more refined with time as, as more trainees take up the opportunity and come back with feedback. So like everything else, it will improve, I think. All right. I wonder if anyone in the audience had any particular questions that they might like to ask our panel members. Thank you. So this is more for the... Um the female members of the, the board, with regards Could, is, to... Sorry, is, is that turned on? Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, so with the... Um, this is more towards the female members of the board. With regards to having children, you guys both said that it was the most worthwhile part of your PhD. Um, if you were to do it again, would you choose to do this, like, earlier, <laughs> later, or, like... <laughs> Like, it's the best part because, yeah. No, I wouldn't change in any other way. I think that was really perfect for me. But I did that in Sweden, so it's a little bit different. Social security system is different in Sweden. So um, we got almost one year of full salary, and also we don't have stipend in, in Sweden, so it's full salary, and, and we pay tax for that, for PhD salary. So then you get full year, you can stay at home with your kid. Um, and then during that time, you still can write papers and, and do publications and all that. So I think for me, it was perfect. Uh, I think um, there's never a perfect time to have children. Never. <laughs> Not if you're a surgical trainee. Uh, if I could choose... I probably would have said the best time would have been medical school, but that's not an option. <laughs> not an option for everyone. I feel like I'm like, oh my god, I'm in my last year. Yeah, this is probably the one aspect of your life you can't have full control over planning, right? So, um, yeah, I think. To be honest, it, it's always going to be difficult. It's probably always going to be the most difficult part of your life because you need to find that balance. And unless you are embarking on that journey, you can't. Um, as a female as well, you can't predict whether you're going to have an easy or a difficult pregnancy, right? And in surgical training, I've seen some of my colleagues have to interrupt their terms because for their medical reasons, they haven't been able to take one on call. And for surgical training, if you are unable to um, fulfil the on-call requirement, you can't pass that term. So you are forced into early maternity leave, right? So for me, I think uh, the perfect time was to have a child during my PhD, um, and also because it was a difficult pregnancy. Um, I'll show you a little bit about my experience. My husband had to get permission to come into work late every day because he had to drive me to the calling so that I could continue working on my PhD because I had such bad morning sickness, I had hyperemesis, and I couldn't catch the train anymore. I couldn't drive anymore. I had to stop the car sometimes when I tried to drive to get out and um, be sick on the side of the road. So you can imagine that's really not compatible with surgical training and the on-call hours. And you all know from your clinical experiences, the system is stretched already. You can't expect your colleagues to cover for you on a regular basis. So it, it is such that if you have easy pregnancies, maybe you can factor into your training, maybe with uh, different terms or with different training programs. I know my sister, who's in GP training, was able to have her child and that was okay. It wasn't a problem, but for some other people, depending on their journey, depending on their circumstances, it can make it really difficult. So um, I'm very thankful that the experience has come at a time when uh, I've had a more flexible lifestyle. Right. 
I wonder if any of the dads on the panel had any comment about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, I've got two young kids. Um, so I've got a three-and-a-half-year-old um, daughter and my son's a year and three months. Um, so over the last few years, it's been challenging because as you get busier um, with research, you get busier with clinical work, teaching, um, all these things converge. But at the same time, you realise just how important it is to spend time with your children. I mean, they're at that critical phase where they just need that time and, and support from their father. And so it's just, again, balancing it uh, is, is difficult, but you've got to make time. So I would, and I'm sure many of us have done this, I would go home um, after a busy day, spend time with the kids, um, wait till they're asleep, and then afterwards I would do my work. And I might go till very late, like midnight. I, I, I'm basically a night owl. Um, and uh, yeah, it would go too late, but at least then you can spend your time with your, with your family, finish your work. And I guess as the kids get older, um, it, it, there's not the necessity to spend as much time, but it's, but again, it's, it's about providing that quality with your family, quality time with your family. I just think it's, I just can't stress how important it is that, and that you've got to find your own balance. All right. Are there any other questions? Good. Hi, panel. Um, I was just curious whether any of you had been in the situation where you might have discovered something in your research that questions the current medical thinking or goes against the grain a little bit, and how you felt about that, how this finding was met by your peers, um, was that challenging at all? Uh, well, I guess I haven't found anything as yet, um, but from Tree, who knows my PhD supervisor very well, um, she believes that most things that she discovers are against the current paradigms. Um, so she's a very well-known immunologist and I couldn't have found a better supervisor to do a PhD with. Um, but I, I, between her and other, um, other researchers in the immunology world, they have great arguments about um, you know, what the sort of current paradigms are and shifting those. Um, and they're incredible arguments to see. Um, and you know, I think they you really learn great biology by witnessing them um, and sort of seeing these differences of opinion from people that are, such, are so vocal from their own work. Um, time will tell whether or not uh, some of these things, how these things change. Paradigms generally shift very, very slowly in medicine. Um, steroids in pregnancy were a great example of that for lung maturity. That was something that was, there was almost 20 years of research in New Zealand for that before we actually started giving that for um, premature babies. But not sure any other panelists have some experience there? Um, so, 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 so I, I think it's really interesting because we sort of now live in, era, in an era where everybody talks about disruptions, right? Disruptive technologies, disruptive ideas. And so shifting paradigms is now, I, I mean, I, I was kind of, um, you know, every grant that I review now, they're shifting a paradigm. So, <laughs> so it seems to be, you know, I, I think it's lost a lot of, it, of its meaning, but, but I, I get what, what you're getting at. Um, and I think it's really interesting because w w one of the really important things about doing what we do is to realize that actually the evidence that we hold to fast when we make our clinical decisions are actually not sometimes as strong as we think they are. Um, and, and you know, I, I don't want to discourage you now and disillusion you by telling you how horrible peer review is and, you know, how difficult it is to get your ideas out if it goes completely against the grain. I think what's more important is that you realise that actually, you know, it's not, um, you know, what people hold as true is, is very fluid and you need, and it will change, you know. You know, I, you know we used to be told, you know, it's swings and round, you know, it, it, the pendulum will swing one way, you know, one year and then 10, 20 years later it'll swing back. And, and so what you need to do then is to almost be able to, you know, sense the direction in which things are going. But more importantly, be able to be knowledgeable enough about it to work out whether it's going in the right direction or, or not. And then 
influence it, push against it, make sure that it is going in the direction that you think is the correct direction. All right. Um, if there are no further questions, then... Oh, wait, there's still one more. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, from a research perspective, do you think there's much value or merit undertaking further education through, say, the form of a master's um, to really um, go ahead with some high-quality research? Or do you think it's something that you should just get amongst and um, learn on the job? Since I got the mic, I'll probably have a little something to say about that. Uh, I know in surgical training, a lot of people are pursuing masters in surgery, and Vincent and I were having a chat about that uh, just a little bit before. Um, that definitely, any extra research you could do, anything you could do to further your education is going to stand you in good stead for the future. Definitely. Even if you don't want to pursue um, a career as a clinician scientist, because I agree with what you said, uh, Professor Fan, and that is that the most um, the most valuable tool that you will learn as a result of doing your own research is to appraise the research that's already out there. I can't tell you how skeptical I've become of everything I read <laughs> as a result of spending some time just at the bench and seeing, you know, how data is treated, how data can be treated, you know, how um, that missing data in your uh, clinical database can affect the results. Um, and you don't really get a true understanding of those things unless you do immerse yourself in research. Um, so whatever it is that you choose to pursue, um, choose it out of interest because you will need interest to see the end of it, I think. Um, and, uh, and know that whatever you pursue, you will have some benefit from it, I think. Anyway, I don't know. If you agree. I mean, I think that's a really, really good question because I think where I've seen a lot of clinicians, like brilliant doctors, um, go to ground when go, they go into the lab is they've never picked up a pipette before and you start again from ground zero. There are kids 10 years younger than you who have much more experience and know more than you do and you have to be able to let go of your ego and, you know, return to ground zero and learn again. And I think... I think there's a lot of value in doing something like a master's and it's not lost ground because if you, if you really enjoy that master's, you can always upgrade it to a PhD. So there, there are lots of, um, but you know, that, that research experience, because you know, I think people need to distinguish between a clinical PhD and a basic science PhD. And I have to say that my, having done a basic science PhD, my recommendation is to stay to your strengths. If your strength is basic science, then go down a basic science PhD. But really, really think hard about what you're actually trying to do with a basic science PhD. And if it's going to be that, then get into the lab and see what it's like before you actually sign away, you know, three to five years of your life. All right. Um, well, with that, we might bring this session to a close and our conference to a close. So thank you to our speakers once again. Thank you to all of our sponsors, um, the Georgia Institute of University of Sydney, UNSW, the ANZAC, the Colling, Westmead, and the Victor Chang. Thank you to the Colling Institute for hosting us. Um, once again, thank you to the Academy for the support for hosting us all to here today. And I wish you all guys the best for the future.